gelo, onde era servido caviar, canapés variados e até mesmo foie gras, um carrinho com uma grande saladeira e algum tipo de assado fatiado só na hora de servir, um cabrito, um roche bife, um carrinho de queijo e fruta, um carrinho de sobremesa, champanhe, um perrinhon, refeições com cinco ou seis pratos, talheres banhados a ouro, bar com cocktail, tudo, mas tudo, gratuito. Quem o diz são testemunhos de hospedeiras de bordo da companhia aérea Panam nos anos 60. Um anúncio antigo desta empresa anunciava que a Panam era a única companhia com mais de 80 pratos principais no cardápio. A Air France repostava com lagosta, com roche vivo, com costeletas, tudo servido em pratos de porcelana. Vá, não é que uma sanduíche que muitas companhias servem agora seja má, não é isso. Mas digamos que é muito diferente da chamada era dourada da aviação. Nos anos 50, 60 e 70, havia quase um metro de espaço entre as cadeiras, isto na classe económica. Hoje em dia, em muitas companhias, temos a sorte de nos se conseguirmos sentar sem que os nossos joelhos batam na nossa testa. Mas nesta relação avião-passageiro não foi só a oferta das companhias que mudou. Uh -uh. Nós também mudámos. Dantes, andar de avião era um acontecimento que requeria as melhores vestimentas ou os melhores penteados. Hoje nós entramos no avião com a descontração de quem apanha mais um meio de transporte para trabalhar, enfim, com uma roupa confortável, nem sempre com estes saltos altos, meias grossas para o frio, uma almofadinha, uns phones, telemóvel e já a pensar nos filmes e nas séries que vamos ver no ecrã. Nos anos 50, viajar era já uma experiência. Hoje em dia, é o meio de transporte que nos leva a viver uma experiência. O perfil dos passageiros mudou, o que procuram num voo também, e a oferta das companhias propôs mudanças nos serviços apresentados. Para além de tudo isto, os fortes impactos económicos e comerciais também moldam a oferta. Conseguir antever o que procuram os passageiros de agora e os de amanhã é fundamental para maximizar a captura de valor de uma companhia aérea. É sobre isto que falamos no próximo painel, aliás, eu já tenho... Os anjos não têm encostas, portanto, já tenho os oradores aqui atrás. Para moderar esta conversa, passo os comandos a Paula Santos, Managing Partner da Kilsa Group. Boa tarde, Paula. E o palco... É isso, palmas, boa! E o palco é seu. <risos> Obrigada, boa conversa. everyone here uh, watching us in Ponte Sur and uh, online via streaming. Uh, so good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you are. Uh, we are today in a completely different world than one year ago. Some for, say for the better, uh, some say that we have even bigger cha challenges than one year ago. Uh, but uh, the theme for Portugal Air Summit is flying for the world of opportunities. So we are here to discuss the opportunities uh, related to the new uh, travel trends. Uh, and with me, I have an amazing panel. Thank, of, uh, thank you for having uh, accepted my invitation. Uh, we are here to, to discuss these new trends, some of them, uh, of course, due to the pandemic that we had in the last uh, two years. Uh, but other trends were already um, emerging, uh, emerging, and so uh, they were boosted by, by the pandemic. Um, so to, to my right, I have uh, Pedro Colasso, he's the CEO and president of uh, Guest Centric. Um, he's the, the Guest Centric is the leading uh, provider of hotel e-commerce solutions across over 50 international markets. He has a proven, proven track record of driving successful product development, marketing, sales and channel management efforts. And in 2018, uh, Pedro led uh, the acquisition of Great Hotels of the World, a global sales and marketing hotel representation uh, company. So, uh, uh, and in 2020, Pedro did an amazing thing. Uh, uh, in order to support uh, uh, the, our Portuguese economy, Pre Pedro led the, the launch of Small Portuguese Hotels, a national soft brand that is now represented by over 140 independent hotels nationwide. So this is... Uh, Thank you in the name of the, the, our economy. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, then to his right, we have uh, Sergio. Uh, Sergio started his career in the, at Deloitte, uh, and now uh, he's working in Travel Store American Express project in, in Portugal, where he's responsible for operations, client management, and, and, mark, and marketing for, for uh, um, 
Angola, Mozambique, Algeria, and Africa. Uh, so thank you also for uh, having uh, for coming. And then we have uh, Roberto. Uh, Roberto Antunes uh, comes from the fast-moving consumer goods market, uh, where he worked all over the, the world uh, in marketing roles. But he's currently executive director of Nest Tourism Innovation, and it has among his founding partners uh, companies like Tourism Portugal and Airports, Google, and Ma Microsoft. So the objective of NEST is to foster collaboration among different stakeholders, anticipate trends, and provide solutions for the needs. Uh, and finally, uh, we have Graham. Uh, Graham comes from the aviation uh, operations consultancy and has now been involved in aviation for over 30 years, uh, leading strategic planning, capacity development, and business change projects globally. He is currently vice chair of the British Aviation Group. To the four, uh, welcome and thank you. And uh, I'd like to discuss some of the trends that are have been emerging, and also if they are temporary or they are here to stay, and how the stakeholders can now adapt to these new travel trends. So I will start to, with uh, the, with Pedro. Uh, with COVID, we've seen a change on the way people book. Um, so can you? Uh, uh, talk about your experience uh, on how did you see these changes occurring during the, uh, the COVID and can you give some examples and if they are temporary or not? Sure, thank you very much for having us here. Um, I think COVID changed dramatically, fundamentally the, the relationship between guests and hotels. We work for hotels, not for airlines, uh, but you know, a lot of guests were booking through intermediaries like Booking.com and Expedia, so the large OTAs. And what happened with COVID was that they, those intermediaries did not have the relevant information for guests to make a decision. For instance, is the restaurant open? Uh, can I take a ride uh, on the horses? Whatever it is that I want to do around the hotel. Therefore, um, during the COVID pandemic, what we saw was that guests got a lot closer to the hotels and hotels had to become a lot more um, counselors to the guests. Um, this trend has carried into 2021 and 2022, and we're seeing that direct booking has grown by, uh, by 10 percentage points versus 2019. So in 2019, probably on average, we were at 30, 35% bookings directly with the hotels. Now we're at 40, 45 on average. Um, so, so that's a, a very big demand now that hotels have and they have less staff, so I, I worry about that, right? Because on one hand, guests are more, are more um, uh, demanding. On the other hand, um, hotels have less staff, so, so they have to rely on technological solutions. So that's one thing. The second thing is um, booking patterns have changed dramatically. So while you know, prior to the pandemic, you potentially had 60, 70, 80% of your hotel filled up before the, the, the day of arrival, now everything is much more fluid. Um, so, so there's a lot of uncertainty, so you need to have more look into data to know what's happening. And I think these things are here to stay, if you, if you ask me. Mm. Um, these, these sort of, it's, it's been too long, it's been two years of the, the same pattern, so I think uh, some of these are gonna, are gonna stay with us. I wanna say just one, one third thing, which is a lot of people are talking about longer lengths of stays. We're not seeing that on, the, on, on our hotels. Um, the change is very small. What we're seeing is that there are people that are booking very long stays, like 30 days and, and beyond. So this whole concept of I'm gonna spend and experience a city is, is coming on board and um, we'll have to wait if that stays. Okay, thank you. Uh, Serge, you work very much with the business travel segment that we nowadays, it's a little bit blurred because we see the blurred travel where home uh, office and work are mingled uh, and business and uh, um, leisure travels are also mingled. Uh, and we were here in this uh, stage uh, one year ago discussing oh, when and how business travel is returning because everyone was saying business travel will not return. So can you tell us where we are at the moment um, uh, in, your, in terms of your experience? Uh, has, they, has it returned uh, or not yet? Yeah, definitely. So thank you very much for the invitation and um, really happy to be here with an employment because at the <laughs> time we were in doubt if business travel would ever become as big as it was before. Everyone was speaking about virtual meetings and how they would replace business travel. 
And, uh, and reality is that when we planned for 2022, we were very cautious. We read a lot of studies by the big consultancy firms, and I think none was even close to guess what, what happened. And uh, what we witnessed is, this, is that in January, we were 65% below compared to January 2019. And suddenly, February, we were like 55%. Um, and it, it, it was really a fast and sudden uh, return, a rebound from companies to, to, to business travel. Uh, we arrived to around May with a 20% decrease compared to 2019. And at, a, at that point, we thought, well, maybe people were missing traveling. They, they travel once, twice, but they'll, they'll go back. They'll go back to their virtual the Revenge business. traveling. But they didn't. <laughs> reality is that they did. And, and, and also the experience maybe was not the best because there were a lot of questions. Do I need to fill this form? Do I need to take this care code? Do, do I have my, my certificate, of my vaccination? Is it okay to travel to that destination? So, um, but reality is that they continued and we, we are still seeing a, a return actually. And I have fresh numbers from yesterday. In September, we, we were 9% over September 2019. And in October, we are around 15% over what we had in, 20, in 2019. And I'm speaking about transactions, because if I speak about turnover or volume, it's even high. Why? Because the average ticket price. The average ticket price, the average hotel room night, everything is more expensive nowadays. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I'm not sure if, if it's going to be like this for the future, because uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be sustainable to, 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 for, for, for travelers and for, for, the, for, the, for the ones that want to, to, to travel either for business or for leisure to continue to afford for, that, for, that, uh, for, for those prices. Um, but yes, yeah, so in, in, in summary, at the beginning of the year, we were very cautious. And as soon as, as uh, most of the, the, the restrictions were lifted, we, we saw huge growth and the sustainable growth in terms of uh, returning to business travel. I'm, I'm glad that you continue. <laughs> and I'm, I can attest to that because when I travel, uh, I, I've seen the, the, the aircraft is uh, with many business travels, yeah. so it's, uh, it's good. Uh, Roberto, uh, in your case, Nest uh, Tourism Innovation Center, uh, you have several partners and uh, you promote the link between your partners and the startup ecosystems. So what are the main areas that your partners are looking for uh, to invest or in terms of searching for innovation? Uh, are they more client-related, are more operational-focused because of the, the problems that Pedro was mentioned? What do, do you see your uh, members uh, looking for? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Paula, for the question. Um, we both have, let's say, the, the partners themselves, which they, 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 they plead for innovation, but we also are incumbent for the distribution, let's say, and the visibility of innovation throughout the whole sector. So we kind of face, uh, let's say, the specificities of the needs of particular companies, but then the overall tourism sector. So I would say um, it varies on the digital, digital maturity level that we're talking about. For instance, for example, on the big companies, they're very sophisticated. So they're more on the transformational models uh, of their businesses. So the kind of technologies that tend to fall more on the tests and trials and pilots that we're doing. It goes on to biometrics, for example, which is broadly now uh, being applied on the travel and the air transportation business. But then the blockchain, the domotics and the, for the room energy controls, or even the 5G-based technologies, this is becoming of particular interest of the hospitality, for example. Um, and then big data as well. So these are companies that are urging now on the use of, uh, of data provided by other big companies and merging them too, so to then provide very sophisticated services based on intelligence. Then we have, let's say, the SMEs, which they represent 90% of the Portuguese uh, landscape. So the most, uh, let's say, advanced ones, which they already embody more of an innovation culture, we definitely see, especially on the activity side, the search for uh, artificial uh, intelligent use, so to collect more data and knowledge on the customers, but also on the experience side. So virtual reality, um, uh, artificial reality, this is something that is, uh, is causing a lot of demand. The cloud services, making sure that the operations are interconnected um, as much as possible. And then the digital marketing as well, so more ways of exposing having more grip on how to uh, make sure that their offering is visible. And I would say that there's the last ones, let's say the more 
common SMEs. Unfortunately, they're less sophisticated. In Portugal, we still, ha still have lots of services which don't own even a website or are even present on a Google Maps, and they are giving the first steps. It's, it's not an easy thing. Um, it's not that Portugal is more lagging or backwards than other markets. The whole Europe, in a way, suffers uh, based on this uh, time for these small companies to make the change. And these ones, I think they are more on the search for, uh, let's say, the revenue management aspect. The first steps on the digital marketing, this is more what they are looking for. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Graham, uh, you design and you are responsible for designing many airports around the, the world. What are the, the most recent trends that you are incorporating in the design of the infrastructure uh, because of these new uh, changing passenger needs and expectations? Sometimes it's not the needs, but it's the expectations that are changing. So what is it that you are now uh, changing in these uh, designs? There's probably quite a few, but I think the three that I'd, I'd most like to highlight, I think the first one is, is an inclusivity of design. So recognizing that um, not just because of an aging demographic, but actually an, a, more, a more open approach to a, a, a full set of customers, just trying to understand the needs of all the different customer groups that we're working with. You know, historically, we've talked about PRMs, passengers with reduced mobility, but actually our challenge is not just PRMs, it's people with invisible disabilities. Uh, we've got people working across cultures, we've got people who've got different levels of familiarity with technology. And just understanding as a designer of the operational process of the CONOPS at the beginning and of the facility, what is that complete range of passengers that we're going to need to serve and what's the wider stakeholder community that we need to, we need to serve within the airport? Um, and how do we tailor the processes in a way that gives everybody as close as possible to quality of access. Um, it's interesting, some of the work that we were doing for the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey in, in generating their customer services manual or helping them in, the, in that process, were saying this needs to go beyond just code. There is a level of code, but if you just do code compliance, you're not really servicing the customer and actually making their journey as pleasurable as possible and actually in the process helping them benefit from the airport and deliver the commercial performance that you want. So I think it's about firstly understanding our customers and, and the, foot, the real breadth of them. Um, I think the second is really the role of digital and automation in the process. And, and some of that is because I think we're getting an increasing number of people, we've heard of, you know, the use of, demo, of um, digital tools in the, in the way we plan our journey, the way we connect our journey, the way we get to the airport, the way we're going to go on from the airport. But it's also just how do I use things like biometrics in planning as a passenger in planning my way through the terminal for those people who are familiar with it and recognizing not everyone's going to want to use the, the technology. But it's also how, how can I use that technology to manage the terminal? So we're sort of getting into that digital operating model. I understand where my flows are. How do I respond to changes in demand? How do I uh, respond to um, degradation of circumstances that said I'm allowed, I, can, I can identify challenges almost before they occur, I can adapt and control the operation to say I know I'm going to, I'm going to use dynamic signage to move the flows this way, I'm going to anticipate a surge here and therefore I'm going to look at my resource modeling. So it's it, how do we use the digital tools to deliver a great experience? Um, and I think the third one which is, you know, I, I think with COVID probably slipped away a little bit but maybe I think we'll, we'll come back again, is the experiential side. So certainly th there's, a, there's a perception that, qu that some airports are very anonymous. Um, we are seeing this, this desire to create a sense of place. <coughs> uh, that doesn't have to be a lot, spending a lot of money, but saying, uh, when I arrive somewhere, I want to understand that I am some, I, I'm there. I'm not just a, 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 another anonymous gray box. Uh, but it's not just about the macro architecture. It, it's also coming back into yeah, the way that we put commercial offerings in, the way we look at signage, the way we connect the airport with the world. So, so for example, the landside interface. But I, I see increasingly conversations in the commercial retail space, not just about a retail offering, which, in, which is a purely transactional, I buy something, but can we create experiential spaces? Um, we see, if you look around Skiphol, some of the elements about things like art gallery type facilities. Um, if we think about the planning of some of the future airports that we're doing at the moment, there is, what's the wow? What, do you make, what makes people say, this is a great experience? Changi, the Changi Jewel is a good example of that. So actually, here's something that's more than just an airport terminal building. So I think those three threads for me, understanding the passengers and serving the full breadth, using the digital tools, and then creating an experiential journey. 
Yeah, thank you. I think that that, that part is very important. I, I normally say that there is a new KPI, which is emotion per square meter uh, in the airports, and that part is very important. And unfortunately, due to the COVID, to the restrictions, we saw experience, the pe travel experience, the passenger experience being affected negatively. People with was afraid to travel and so on. But hopefully, uh, I now uh, this will change and we start to look again at this emotion. Coming back uh, uh, to Pedro, uh, we saw during COVID um, that uh, flexibility was very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Of, of cancelling flexibility, change data, uh, data, dates. Um, and so uh, many stakeholders adjusted, airlines adjusted, hotels adjusted, but now we are seeing some of these stakeholders, mainly airlines, going back to the old rules of not being able to adjust or change. Um, so do you believe that flexibility will continue to be important if there is no way back, or uh, there will be, will be other competitive factors that will be important in the future? Um. I, I think actually that we're seeing the same in hotels, right? So obviously with COVID, everybody went through fully refundable uh, reservations. We uh, have had a flurry of cancellations through the pandemic. Um, and interestingly enough, what has happened this year was that January and February were horrendous in terms of cancellations. Then we saw cancellations go down, and then we saw cancellations go up again in the summer because there were so many flexible policies. So hotels are going back to non-refundable rates, 15-day cancellation, that sort of stuff that we saw in 2019, and I think that's coming back. Um, I think that there's a, a twist on this, that there's a lot of players trying to get into the insurance business related to non-refundable rates. Um, you know, we have fintech companies that are yeah. trying to, uh, you know, give consumers an option uh, based on whatever algorithms they run. So, but I do think that from the supplier perspective that we're going back to non-refundable rates, um, because um, there's so much demand. Nobody was expecting so much demand in 2022. The demand stays very high right now. So un un unless demand starts going down, I don't see us um, going back to a fully cancelable sort of experience. Yeah, m many airports uh, here in Portugal, for example, they are already at 90 something percent. Uh, no one expected a full rec recovery until 2025. Right. Uh, so you think that this uh, flexibility w will... Uh, uh, not absolutely, absolutely. And hotels the same. So we have a lot of hotels running at full capacity. We short with shortened staff. So there's a whole lot of issues there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, in order in, in to your client uh, needs and uh, your client requests, did you see any changes during uh, during COVID? There are uh, there are new requests, and if yes, are the stakeholders providing this uh, or not? Or, do, or there was any a uh, specific uh, challenge that you now have that you didn't have before the COVID? Yeah, yeah. we, we see uh, some differences, uh, both from travelers and travel managers within, within companies. Um, companies became more, more concerned with what we call safety and control, safety of the travelers, so the, the duty of care, yeah. and control of what's happening. So they're looking for um, technology that helps them understanding who is traveling to where, where do they stop. Um, they, they're mandating travelers to, to book hotels through us, which is a bit contradictory with what uh, Pedro said. But uh, we, we, we think a rise on the, what we call the hotel attachment rate. So, and, and tra travel managers are telling us, well, we, we saw that we had leakages on our travel programs. People were booking hotels by themselves, and then we, we were not aware where they were staying, how much we were spending. And now they, they are centralizing even more on, on the travel agency. Um, a change that we also saw is a sense of urgency. Every, every contact needs to be answered in, forget the SLA of up to two hours. No, no, it's up to maybe to that. 20 minutes. <laughs> if, and eventually in the 21st minute, they're calling us. Yeah. So, so that required us to, to look at our business and, and adapt to that reality because it's not going to change. I think that these two years where we, we stood at home, we were speaking to everyone at the same time virtually, we're not moving from our room to other room to meet the people, made us uh, think that we can, we can have answers immediately from, from everyone. Um, and so we have to adapt, we are developing chat channels, we are, but, but of, of course that means that we have to invest in people. We all know that, we all know in this room, in, in this world, that there's a shortage of people everywhere. Uh, so the challenge is huge in that, in that respect. Um, we also saw, just to finish, in terms of, of changes, 
um, when, it, when, when it comes to, 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 again, safety and control, the, the, the need to approval. A, a lot of companies didn't have a proper approval process or they would have something in written that they could not even understand if it is a six or a nine. So now they're looking for a proper approval. It's again, it's technology taking a, a toll on, 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 on in this business. And, and, and as, I, as I said, our vision, it's, it, it is something that it's acquired and it's not going to go, to go back. It's, it's the opposite. They, they will go to, they, they will want to, to strengthen even more that, that, that perspective. Okay. And if I may just add yeah. something here, right? Because we see exactly the same thing, which is on the leisure side, a lot of people booking directly with hotels and on the corporate side being forced to go through yeah. travel management yeah. companies. So to some extent, we all talk alive. about leisure trips and they are happening, but operationally they're becoming more yeah. difficult. No, and they're definitely, they're, well, 10 seconds, yeah. they're happening. And well, I'm not saying that we anticipated, but we, we read what, what was happening and we, for instance, we created a, a, an area of service which is a bit blurred, which is uh, basically yeah. pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we, we trying to fulfill the travel expectation, which is I'm, I'm traveling for business, but I, I want to, to stay or I, I want someone to meet me there and stay for, for the weekend. So uh, yeah, it required us to train our people because it's, it's different. We are specialized in corporate travel, business travel. Uh, we also have a unit in terms uh, that takes care of uh, high-end leisure. So we had to kind of combine both units to, to, to deliver a proper uh, uh, overall service to the, to the traveler. Yeah, this blurred travel is something that is happening and many hospitality companies are, are now responding to it, like Selena, like MCR yeah. Hotels. Just uh, some uh, weeks ago, I had launched work at Tyatt. So this is something I think is something that it's a trend that we will see m much more in the in the future. Um, going back to, to Roberto, Portugal, fortunately, is now again on the uh, top destinations and is especially sought of by nomad travel. So we have a very strong demand for this. Do you think that our tourism ecosystem is ready for, for this, for answering the needs of these specific travels? What is uh, uh, your feedback from, uh, that you have from the... I, I think it's on the way too. We have great examples, so you already pointed a few of them, like Selena is kind of the world leader on this aspect a couple of years ago. And the way to enter in Europe, they decided that it was through Portugal. And this is because Portugal has amazing conditions for nomads to actually to establish, you know, the condition of a nomad normally is to stay during a, a period of uh, three months minimum, and while doing uh, traveling, they work so both at the same time during the same day. So Portugal it definitely has. So the whole appeal, the security, the climate, and also good Wi-Fi conditions, etc. Um, but in fact, uh, and, and based on what we, we done in, in, uh, in last a couple of think tanks, and, and this is one of the, the ones that we've done because it's not a trend, um, the nomadism will tend to become more mainstream. And because before even the, the, the pandemics, approximately 20% of the European population was already working on this kind of model of not being forced and obliged to go into a, a, um, an office uh, mandatorily every day of the week. And uh, this is a kind of a win-win situation because it helps on the balance of uh, life and work. Um, and this is good for the companies because it represents less costs, less landlord or mortgages or costs of electricity, etc. And then on the other side, people are happier and actually attends as well of one very important thing, which is the Generation Z becoming now really the bulk of the working force. And these people, uh, so our, our cousins, our sons, etc., they, they put more on the top of the priority traveling and connecting more than creating a family or owning a car or a house. So this model will become even, even more, more relevant. So Portugal attracts a lot of these people, and I have a couple of notes here on what these people say that would be, you know, an improvement, a betterment of what we can do in Portugal. First of all, information. So not everything is actually gathered to make sure that these people, when, once they're deciding on where to go, they spot Portugal as the direction. So we need to attract them, telling them, you know, of all, especially the second point about the bureaucracy. So even though we feel that sometimes we're not, but in face of the eyes of the people that are coming from abroad, we're quite bureaucratic. Imagine, for example, to open a bank account, you have to have an address which is registered in the tax uh, system. And this is not very simple for them. And this is a very basic thing. Or in, in order to make transfers or to use 
your bank account, you have to own a, mobile, a Portuguese mobile phone number, and you are staying for approximately three months. So they kind of think, why do I have to do this? So we have to be more agile, more flexible in these situations, so to create um, a, better, a better position. And then, uh, for example, accommodation. Not every space is ready to have a common space for work, uh, or even the rooms uh, are thought on the principle that these people are going to stay lots of hours inside. So Wi-Fi needs to be stable. There has to be a common old kitchen, because if you're staying for three months, you're not going to have lunch and dinner every day at a restaurant. Your budget normally cannot afford that. Building community as well, they want to be integrated also with the locals, so we have to think of ways of connecting. And this brings me to the last point, which is very interesting, which is the potential of retention of these people, because they're very highly, highly skilled on new professions. They normally work as uh, uh, digital experts, marketing, you know, on what is the new uh, professions, and this is what we also need, um, and of high demand and shortage on the offering. So this is an opportunity for Portugal, given that we attract, how can we retain part of that? So keeping them very well connected with the, with the locals, with entrepreneurs, with local structures, is an opportunity then who think of, of staying as an opportunity. So I see this as a, not as a trend, this will become more and more common on a working life for people to come to Portugal and stay for a very long time period, and tourism needs to benefit from it. Yeah, I think it's very, the, what you just said in the last point is very important, how to attract them, no? not just to yeah. having them here for three months, but how do we keep them yeah. here? Now um, they're finding their way, but yeah. I think we need to structure ourselves and say, yeah. like, we have all these conditions for you to come. Yeah. So instead of, uh, I don't know how many come, maybe 5,000, there's a potential uh, in the world, they say this 31 million uh, um, uh, digital nomads traveling uh, numbers of 2021. So this is now, let's say, a market, a very interesting market. Yeah. Imagine that every year it will potentially double. Mm -hmm. So it will become a very, very interesting market of very bright people with highly skilled of things that it's very important for us to retain. Yeah, here let's in hope Portugal. that we are able to. Uh, to attract them here. Uh, Graham, uh, you have, uh, from your experience of having worked with many airports around the world, what are uh, the key success factors uh, for providing an excellent passenger experience? We were just, you were talking about a little bit earlier about this uh, uh, experiential, uh, but what are the, the key success for, for providing uh, overall better passenger experience, not only in the air, but also you talked about the interface about in terms of ground access and so on. So what is for you the key success factors that you see in, in your clients? I, I would say, and we, we did some benchmarking of this for, uh, for things like the JFK work, but elsewhere. Um, to be honest, the first one is Brilliant Basics. That I think if, if you try and look, at, you know, and as a, as a, as a passenger, uh, you look at some, some of the service providers, some of the low-cost carriers actually do an incredibly good job because you know exactly what you're going to get. Yeah. And I think the, you know, it's, it's, it comes almost to a hierarchy of needs. It says, the first thing I want to know is I want to know that I arrive somewhere on time um, without, with minimum num amount of fuss. I get my bags. Um, I can use the facilities on the way. I can find the facilities on the way. So in, in, in many respects, I think if you look around the world's airports, you know, the really important thing is you get the basics right. So that is things like cleaning. Um, and it's not just uh, I clean on a routine basis. I actually have a really, really well-planned approach to my cleaning. So I, I use data to say when do I need to clean. I schedule my cleaning so that I do it base, you know, aligned with the peaks. Um, I make sure that it's, I have a, a cleaning regime that it, it really gives you something that you actually want to say, I'm really happy to go and use these facilities. So I think you know, it's, it's things like cleaning. It's things like wayfinding. Um, and, and one of the things I think you find that it, in a facility, even no matter how well it designed it was, you get this plethora of wayfinding coming in and additional signage. And we were doing some work on security productivity improvement somewhere. I just said, actually, there's no way the passengers are actually going to understand what is expected of them because there's so much noise in the space. I, c I don't know what's going on. Yeah. So it's, it is coming back to that real simplicity that says, I've got a really straightforward, simple product. And actually, I, my passenger can get from the curb to, to wherever they want to be. They can find a seat. They can orientate themselves. And then they can think about the experience. So I think it's that 
core get get the get the the core process right, um, and that's not about spending large amounts of money. It's a it's a real it's an operational efficiency, operational effectiveness mentality. Um, I think the second is customer centricity, and we talked a bit about you know understanding the customers, um, and that's about us. You know I think that does come back to us sharing data, understanding who the customers are, recognizing they're not my customers or your customers, they're our customers, and actually they're going to come back if they like the end-to-end -end journey. But it's then about saying, if I understand the customers and what their needs are, I can respond to those and tailor a product offering to them. Um, and I think the third, you know, that sort of builds on that, is how we use data. Um, so it's interesting, you've got things like the ASQ scores. Um, not all airports subscribe to the ASQ process, um, but those who do find is, you know, there's a great richness of data. I can think though of a large airport group I worked with <coughs> a few years ago where they did the ASQ, um, they actually had, had lost track of where they were on it and there were people who thought they were doing a great job and actually when you looked at the data it wasn't there. But even if you then looked at the headline, they weren't actually using that to drive performance. And I think if you look at the people who are doing a really good job, they take that data and they really work it. So, so I, I, I'm looking at, let's say, my, my wayfinding and I'm getting a 4.1. I think I ought to, I don't want to be a five because it's going to cost me too much money, but I should be a 4.3. What are the things I can do? And then you start using things like Mystery Shopper. You use the data to say, what could I do to be where I want to be? So it's really using all of the sources of knowledge, intelligence that we can have that says, I'm going to do, I'm going to really target delivering a great product. Yeah. So I think it's that really use, use what we can to say, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm actually really focused on delivering the customer what they want and what's valuable to them, not what I think I can throw lots of money at. You're, you are right. The, the, I think the basics are very, very... We no, normally, in uh, my company, work in, uh, with airports in the commercial areas uh, and to develop the commercial areas, but I always say, do the basic right, do the basic first, because have a good bathroom, a clean bathroom, and you have been doing bathrooms for so many years, so we should <laughs> do it right, right? But sometimes I don't know why they don't. Um, and so that's, that's the key, because if you do the wayfinding right and the bathroom right and so on, then people will shop and will be more available to, uh, to, sh to shop. And uh, wayfinding is uh, very uh, interesting because uh, I just flew with my daughter some days ago from Lisbon Airport, and she looks saying, the Portuguese here will understand, but in uh, Lisbon Airport it says sanitarius. And she was like, which is, what is sanitarius? <laughs> so, because this is a word that we have in Portugal for bathroom, uh, but we only seem to use it in the Lisbon Airport, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, um, coming back here again to, uh, um, to Pedro. So, do uh, you work, of course, more in the uh, hospitality side, but do you see any opportunities for stronger collaboration between the, all the all different stakeholders in the industry uh, that could lead to improved service level or operational improvements? Um, do, you, do you see this uh, kind of collaboration uh, as important for, for living in the future dealing with these uh, uncertainties and these challenges that we will have for sure in the future? I think technology can solve a lot of the, the... The trip is a little bit disconnected right now, and travel management companies have been connecting trips for, uh, for consumers for a very long time, so I think technology may help that. I think that the thing that, that we haven't discussed here is, and I do know this is an air show, but I do think that there's going to be a, a very big cliff between who's driving and who's flying. And I think that driving, electric buses, trains are going to become a real alternative to flying, especially within Europe. Mm. And, uh, and I think airports have to think about that. I'm not sure um, what that means, yeah. but, uh, but I think the whole sustainability factor and the whole you know, alternative electric transportation that's showing up mm -hmm. may change dramatically. And for instance, one of the things we've done was with small Portuguese hotels, which we launched during the pandemic, we knew that people could not fly internationally, right? There was just no way because borders were shut down. So people are um, going back to their own countries and finding out what can I do in my own country. So, so I think that we have to start thinking about consumers as a, a cube of different things, right? Where they may stay at home for a couple of, 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 for a couple of nights and then they may travel internationally a couple of times a year. So I think the whole complex is changing 
we're going to have to wait and see. We're going to have to measure. I'm with Graham there. We, all of this, there's data on all of this stuff. So I think we, we have to measure all of this. And that's why I can't really answer your question of how are stakeholders going to work together? Because I think that there's going to be competitors emerging that weren't your competitors before, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, you are right. Uh, there are going to be some competitors coming out of uh, of this industry. We have tomorrow a, a panel exactly on this uh, in order to see how the industry can compete with this new emergency, uh, emergent challenge from other uh, from other modes of transportation. Uh, so. Uh, if anyone wants to, to find out, <laughs> watch tomorrow's panel. Um, going back to, to uh, Sergio and now touching uh, uh, an issue, uh, um, we saw this summer uh, a chaos across the, the airports, and I'm sure that that was very difficult uh, for your company to, uh, to manage because you work with the business segment. So, um, so what, what were you seeing uh, during the summer and what impact did you have in your operations? And, but this is something that we need to be prepared in the future to, to uh, right? So we need to build on this experience. Uh, so what was the, the key learnings from all of this? Well, first of all, fortunately for us, summer is not the strongest part of the year because business travel is not happening that much in summer. But, but nevertheless, we have business travel in summer. And, and as you said, it's not it's not only on summer, it's, it's going on. I would say that, in a way, disruptions used to be an exception, and now they became our reality. We have to incorporate in our business that it's a disruptive world. There's, there's strikes, there's, there's cancellations, there's airports that are limiting their capacity. And that requires for us to, to adapt, because we are getting more and more calls um, emergency calls to, 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 to take care of the rebooking of the, of, of, of the tickets, to, to host the travel somewhere else because he couldn't fly, could fly back. So uh, in our case, where we had two or three people uh, entry calls after hours, now at some point we had to have five, six or seven because the, main, the, the number of calls was, was, was huge. So yeah, the, the fact that we are in a, in a world that is um, facing a huge challenge in terms of service delivery, especially when, when service delivery requires human people. Um, that makes for us to also uh, need to invest a lot and also, and also train, because you know, taking care of a, a, a disruption and an emergency is a bit different compared to answering an email that is requesting a, a booking for, 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 for uh, in two or three days. Um, and just picking up a little bit on uh, what Pedro was saying, we ourselves had also to adapt in terms of these new con concepts. Probably two years ago, we didn't have that much rail, European rail uh, requests. Now we have many more. So we had to establish contracts, relationships with those, with those companies. So it's a, it's a changing world, and we have to be really focused on the customer, read, uh, listen to, to him, read what, what he's telling us, and, uh, and, and adapt our capa capability so that we, uh, we, we can excel on what he is, is requiring. Yeah, we need to be agile. Um, Robert, coming back to what you were saying about uh, the normal mat tra uh, travels and how we can capture here, uh, just uh, how can we uh, use these new trends in order to reduce the seasonality that we are seeing in some of our domestic um, uh, tourist mar markets and to increase demand on the less tourist ones? Um, so can, can technology help? Uh, you said uh, many things that we're looking at, but can we use also these new trends in order to capture these uh, and, and to decrease the seasonality and, uh, and to attract them, for instance, to the, to the north and interior and so on? Yes, no, absolutely. I think it was already mentioned several times about the customer centricity. And uh, to, to be fair, this is about trying to spot the right offering for the right person and make it as much customable, uh, customized as possible. This means that it will, won't probably fall into the need of being only offered by midsummer, uh, meaning that we have evolved so much in the offering of Portugal. So we've seen from a decade ago such a huge transformation. From a beach and sand country, now we offer cycling and uh, 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 nature, uh, religion, literacy, architectural tourism, wine tourism, which are not dependent necessarily 
on, you know, on a specific season or are forcedly, let's say, an offering that has to happen during the summer. So it's about providing the right valorization of these uh, offerings. There will be demand for any kind of tourism. It's a matter of us working out the product itself, the service, so it reaches the interested people. The less people it exists, the better, because it's more special, it's more costly, so it's more of a higher-end kind of, va of, of, of tourism, and what we're looking for is about value tourism, no, not mass market. So in a way, this is a transformation that will enable us to become each time more premium, um, creating very detailed and specific narratives, and this is what will make the Portuguese markets actually to thrive. I would mention as well two things when it comes to um, capturing or surfing the wave on trends. I think it's about the governance and intelligence, so it was already mentioned here a while ago. It's about making a clever use of data. It already exists. When you start to cross two sources, then an enormous amount of uh, magic and information comes in. When you cross with even more, then your kind of exponential uh, knowledge uh, comes out. So it's very important to work out on the digital literacy of companies. The more literacy exists, the more of each of those small companies can actually make use of those data, plug in their systems, and answer in a much more fast fashion uh, the new opportunities and the new trends. Um, other things will actually as well provide a great, great opportunity such as blockchain. I will not go in details. But the opportunity of aggregating the offering into a more scale, it's also very important. And so technology, for example, blockchain, in my opinion, is going to be paramount for, for tourism. And then finally, is about providing the right values for the assets. So Portugal has millions of narratives in the countryside, in the very low uh, population areas. It's a matter of providing the incentive for people to become entrepreneurs and provide beautiful stories in those places. And then there will be people around the world interested to go there. It's a, it's a matter of us finding the ways of exposing those, uh, those products and services. And, and if I, I may add just one thing, because I do think that there is an opportunity for, and the airlines are actually capitalizing on it, because there's no long haul or there's a lot less long haul going on. So there's been a lot more point to point to secondary and tertiary cities in Europe. And we're seeing demand exploding in those cities. So there are certainly new destinations that can be, be explored. explored. Yeah. I, uh, our time is uh, almost over. And I just wanted to, to make a uh, last question to, to Graham. So uh, we know the, uh, I was, we are talking with Sergio. Uh, these disruptions that we saw in the in the summer, um, many related to shortage of, of staff, but mo also related to capacity issues. We see Heathrow capping capacity. Uh, Amsterdam continues to cap capacity. How do you think that uh, airport ma can manage these in order uh, to decrease the impacts they ha it has on the passengers? Can they? How can they become more? Uh, more agile and more uh, flexible in uh, in the future? Uh, and, uh, b being very, very brief on it, I think the first one is people. We have to recognize, and it's not it's not unique to any one, of the, uh, one player in the game. I think it's, it's across the industry, and actually the issues we're seeing at Amsterdam and Heathrow are not necessarily at the airport or the airline or the ground handlers. It's a system level. So I think number one is we have to reignite the passion for people to see careers in aviation. And actually, things like this event are great in doing that to get as diverse and as broad and as deep a pool of people in the, in the industry. So we've got the people to do the work. I think the second is we've got to look, look much more at automation and the technology and say, where, where the job doesn't need a person, where we can automate it, we're going, to have sh we're going to have staff shortages for a long period of time, I think. Therefore, let's look at automation, more use of automation. And I think the third is this operational excellence that says, let's just get really, really good at doing the job so we are as efficient as we can. Um, and I think that's, you know, if we do that, then we'll have a resilient solution and hopefully we'll be able to get the most out of the systems we've got. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good message for, for this event, people, because we have many panels about uh, training people, development, and so on. And I'd like to thank you all for, for uh, being here and to sharing your ideas and your hands-on experience. And I uh, hope to see you next year. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.